All right, hey guys, welcome to the Daily Word, verse by verse. Grab your Bibles and follow along as we continue in our study, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, through the Bible. Currently, we are in the book of Matthew, going through the Gospels. And as I stated before, the Gospels is God's record. <clears throat> it is God's revelation. What he wanted us to know about his son. Um, it is uh, the Gospels are not biographical, so it's not meant to get give a blow by blow of the life of Jesus. Certainly, it would be interesting, right? What did Jesus do at 20, 21, whatever? But the the, the Gospels are what God wanted us and what we needed. To know about his son for the purpose of our faith um, and so we are in chapter 5 and this is the uh, famous Sermon on the Mount and one of the interesting things about the Sermon on the Mount and as, as, as we kind of laying the foundation uh, as we get past I think this section we will move a little faster through it but um, and basically what also I, I would say that the Sermon on the Mount, it is a con contrast between uh, bad religion, man's religion, man's interpretations, man's traditions, right? Uh, man's precepts <coughs> and what God has established and what God decided. And so remember, uh, Matthew, this is God's. Uh, Jesus um, is giving his criteria for what it what it means to be a disciple his disciple and um, even if we wanted to use the term Christian uh, the Christian term has been so muddy so diluted uh, its basic definition is Christ follower okay Christ follower and uh, so if you say you are a Christian that means you are following Christ which would fit this Sermon on the Mount scene here where the crowd gathered okay they gathered and now Jesus is telling them well if you want to follow me here's what my requirements are I'm amazed continue to be amazed today I'm really not amazed. I shouldn't say amazed, but um, sometimes I am amazed and stunned how we think Christianity is a la carte, that Christianity is subject to what I think, what I want to make up, how I want to view life or whatever. And so, um, um, if you are a true follower of Christ, here's my thing, then you ought to be following Christ. If you are a true follower of Christ, right, in the word, you will be attentive to what he is saying. So, um, again, I want to, um, the, the Beatitudes, and as I said before, the, the, this, this term Beatitudes is really a mis. No more. I'm not, that's 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 a theological designation plastered on uh, Bibles. Remember, Jesus never called these beatitudes. Okay, what he did say, th these are qualities. I'm going to get back to this in a moment, but I want to get down to verse 13 again. I'm going to come. I'm going to talk about these qualities, but he says here in verse 13 again, "You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt should lose its taste." How could it be made salty? It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled by men. And then he says, you are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp, <coughs> excuse me, and put it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your lights shine before men so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father 
in heaven. And, and I, I wanted to come back to this because this here is purpose. This is why we're here. And if, um, um, let me see here. Here it is. I'm going to, I'm going to do something again. Now, I want to uh, go back here. I want to put something up. This is by opening thumbnail. But if you look at this again, um, without my clock, but the reason why I chose this picture for this, when he says that we are the light, notice the picture of the world and you see points of light all over the world. Now imagine those points of light are Christians, right? Imagine those points of light are Christians, okay? And God places us all over the world, all over the planet. And I think I said in a couple of studies ago, um, the body of Christ collectively, can it, we, do, we, are, we spread in more places than um than than any one evangelist right you you jesus this, these crowds here that jesus um is speaking to number in the thousands right he had at some times you could probably say 10 20 thousand people gathering around him when he fed the five thousand the four and five thousand the two separate occasions and they were actually people who were following him he had been teaching and preaching and they had been following him and um for um two or three days and and so he did not want to you know release them <coughs> without you know he wasn't fainting away that was one of the reasons why he fed them but um even with that, that was just a fraction of the people. And so what, what happened is that they did spread out. And over the three and a half years period, you had people that spread out all over the Roman world. My point is, this is why we're here. Um, you can almost say the not so good news is sometimes this is why also we're in circumstances that we're in. Right? In other words... God, when we talk about unfavorable, not good circumstances, sometimes God kind of leaves us there. Why? To let our light shine. So, for example, if we ask the question, why slavery? And, and we ask this from a biblical perspective, from, from the standpoint of Jesus, not a social justice, not an American freedom okay and this is kind of this is hard the question if you were in slavery what would God say to you in that particular moment of time and that is let your light shine now in the case if you go back 2,000 years there were Roman slaves it was estimated up to a third of the Roman population that um, that um, were slaves and they had no hope in fact the first century slaves did they lived their lives out slaves except those under certain circumstances that could gain their freedom but very few gained their freedom in retrospect to the entire population of slaves um, my point is that um, had I been born hundred years ago maybe let's say 150 years ago 160 right I would be a slave and if I had this knowledge that I have what would God say to me let my light shine and regardless of the movement okay regardless of the movement in society as a Christian letting my light shine in other words I could take my position for sure that God is saying to me let your light shine and no God wasn't saying that I here doing he, um, he ordained slavery and these 
uh, horrendous circumstances in which people live in, right? Um, but you can also say the same, like with Joseph. Now you look at the, the Joseph in the in the Bible. He had a purpose. One of the most astounding things about Joseph, who was um, uh, Jacob's um, second to youngest son, okay, he was born to Rachel, and um, but his brothers hated him, and they they were going to kill him. <laughs> I'll show you the kind of scoundrels they were <clears throat> before God kind of worked that out of them, but. <clears throat> they were going to kill him. Uh, but then Reuben, the eldest son, just said, hey, man, we can't kill him. He's our brother, right? Imagine having that conversation. That's weird. We can't kill him. He's our brother. And they meant to kill him. So he talked them out of it and said, hey, they, they put him in a pit. And Reuben was kind of hoping that, you know, put him in the pit. I'll come back and get him out later, sneak him out, and spare his life. But while Reuben was gone... Uh, they sold him to Potiphar, you know, the Egyptian uh, captain in his guard. And for the next 20 years, he never saw his family. Joseph didn't see his family. And you can almost say that if anyone could have said, why me, God? If anyone, right, why me? Joseph, right? Joseph gets into Egypt. He's a slave, and yet God gives him favor, and he becomes the head slave. No, no. It's if as a slave, yeah, it's great that you're a slave, but it, right, he still he never forgot his family. We always we see that throughout his 20-year journey, he never forgot his family. He never lost the sense of the value of his life that he knew it was stolen from him. And even though he was, God had given him favor, he was doing a great job. Of course, part of his wife tried to seduce him. And when he turned down the, uh, the, the advances, she cried rape, he ended up in jail. So again, if anybody could say, why me, Lord? Joseph could have been that person. And in jail, Joseph... Again, God gave him favor. He was good at what he was doing. He became kind of a, I guess today we would kind of call them, uh, uh, what they call them in jail when they, they kind of earn, uh, they're the name that just escaped my, uh, my, 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 my mind here. Um, but certain prisoners can earn a place of trust and uh, they give them, they, they, they give them freedom. Well, actually, so Joseph kind of, kind of ran the, 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 the prison. And while he was in there, two of Pharaoh's, the butler and the uh, and the and the butler and the cook, ended up in jail. Joseph interpreted a dream they had. Joseph told the one, "You're going to die in three days," but the other one, he said, "You're going to be restored." And he said this, "And and when you get restored, remember me." Because and then just what I tell you, after all this time, he still remember. He said, "I was." stolen from my family. I was wrongly put here and then I was wrongly put in jail. But two years go past. God gives Pharaoh a uh, a dream that only Joseph <laughs> could solve. And it just so happens that no one could interpret the dream. The butler said, hey, you know, I, you know, I remember when I was you know, when I was in jail, this guy interpreted a dream and said that I would be restored to my place. And here I am. This guy can interpret the dream. So God used that situation. And as it turns out, Joseph came, he interpreted the dream. Not only interpreted the dream, but gave him wisdom to how that, that there was a coming famine, a severe famine that would hit the entire earth. Told him how to do it and said, you need to appoint a man that can handle that. Pharaoh said, Pharaoh said <laughs> you got the goods. You got the wisdom. And from that moment, he got promoted to number two just under Pharaoh. So he went from the jail to the number two spot. Now, you can imagine, and, and, and Pharaoh even said that, you guys will live and die 
at Joseph's word. He says, only I'm greater than him. That means all y'all got to bow the knee. His story is fascinating. You can imagine the revenge he could have got on Potiphar's wife. Potiphar. Even the butler who forgot him. But when he came to his brothers, his brothers end up had to come <coughs> and purchase grain because no one else had it. And again, they were in a severe um, a famine. Once he revealed himself to his brothers, he made this astounding statement. He said, don't be angry with yourself. He says, God sent me here to preserve you. And that's that's astounding perspective. That's why he, he didn't have to have bitterness. And I'm saying, I, I, I'm not going to even say that he didn't wrestle at times with bitterness. He'd certainly probably at times wrestled with the why me. But he was able to have this perspective. It was God who sent me here. Now, I'm saying that in the New Testament, we have uh, a purpose wherever we are. Right. If we're in the poorest of neighborhoods, the poorest of areas or the wealthiest of er of, 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 of um, area, if we're in the lowliest of jobs or the highest of jobs, Jesus says, let our light shine. Now, let me go back. Notice this statement here, because he says. Um, verse uh, 15. Um, now, verse 16, in the same way, let your lights shine before men. So that's the purpose right there. Wherever it is that we're doing, let your lights shine before men so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Now, notice that, that they may see, let your light shine, that they what? May see. Now, I want you to get this. Let your light shine that they may see your good works. In other words, God says, because you're light and because of who you are and where you are, people are going to watch you. So in other words, give them something to see. Give them a show. Where God's models, modeling, well, his show pieces, his light, Give them something to see. But notice what he says right here. Back in verse 16 again. In the same way let your lights shine before men so that they may see your good works and give glory to God. Now what is a good works? Good works may be your faith. Good works may be even your attempt to win them. So what does he say? Let your light shine that they may see. Now, the interesting thing is that they may see and then glorify your father, which is in heaven. OK, now. <coughs> excuse me. So um, I want to just give you a quick. Again, I've got to pull this up right quick. Uh, thankful for. Um, um, what does it mean to glorify God? Now, look at that verse again. He says that they may glorify um, your Father in heaven. What does that mean? Right? What does that mean? And I'm going to uh, pull this up right quick. I want to show you. This is in, in Philippians chapter 2. And um, uh, huh. all right, <clears throat> I, I want to show you just by way of continuity of scripture. What does it mean to glorify God? Now, notice there is a it, because our our life meaning to let our light shine okay to let our light shine will lead to people glorifying the father <coughs> excuse me but what did that mean 
to, to glorify uh, God. I'm going to show you this in Philippians chapter 2. Uh, alrighty. Uh -huh. Alright, this is Philippians chapter 2. And um, now, um, <clears throat> I just want to. This is talking about the Lord Jesus who he came to came from heaven to earth. And notice what he said. This is verse 8. He said he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on the cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him a name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So notice that we confess, okay, when a person confess Jesus as Lord, that is to God's glory. So one we are put on this earth to help facilitate that, right? So he says, um, verse 16 again, in the same way, let your light so shine before men so that they what? That they can see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. So, uh, you know, uh, to our shame sometimes, we're not letting our light shine, right? And that what? Be, then becomes what blockage <laughs> like a shade so the what what so as the you know when we're not living the way that we should think about this when we're not living the way that we should what is that causing the world not to see and of course we're talking about our good works right that they're not seeing our good works so that they can give and give glory to God our Father. Now, let me, uh, I want to go to um, 2 Peter. And remember, Peter was at this Sermon on the Mount, and this is some probably 30 years after, 25 to 30 years after. And this is Peter speaking. He says, verse 11, Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and temporary residents to abstain from fleshly desires which war against you. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles so that in the case where they speak against you as those who do what is evil, they will by observing, take note of that word, observing your good works and then what? Glorify God on the day of visitation. So, Again, notice that Peter said, if we abstain, right, we abstain. And then notice this, he says, we, they abstain. Um, so in the case, uh, verse 12 again, conduct yourself honorably among the Gentiles, so that in the case where they speak evil against you, um, they speak against you as what is evil, they will by observing your good works glorify God on the day of visitation. And one of the kind of interesting thing there, what he is saying, is that though they say something, so they're saying you're evil, so they are speaking against you as being evil, they will, what they cannot contradict what they see. Right? Now think about that. They're saying one thing, but they see. Now you could tell people all day long how good you are. You could say to people all day long, um, I'm great, I'm not this, I'm whatever. But when you show them They cannot contradict, again, what they see. And that's the difference. 
Now I want to also go to First Peter chapter three, and I'm going to extract this. This is talking about wives, but this is the same conversation that Peter is having. Okay, this is the same conversation that he is having. So verse 1 says, in the same way, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands so that even if some disobey the Christian message, they may be won over by the message. I mean, I'm sorry. They may be won over without a message by the way their wives live when they observe. And that's why I wanted to use this. When they observe your pure, relevant, relevant lives, your beauty should not consist of of outward things that like elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold and ornaments and the fine clothes. Instead, it should be uh, cons it should consist of what is inside the heart with imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very valuable in God's eyes. So he tells us to adorn. Tells you know, and, and by the way, this thought has been carried on. He's just talking to the wives. But he's, remember, he started off telling all of us, the, the body of Christ, the church, God's followers, that we should adorn ourselves. Okay? We should adorn ourselves. There are certain qualities that we should adorn ourselves. Now, let me, uh, I'm going to go to Colossians. Um, and I like this verse, this chapter here, because Colossians... It, to me, it's kind of in a nutshell what I want to say here. <clears throat> so, remember he tells us, let our light so shine. We, we are light in the world. So, look at, this is Paul's letter to Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. So, if you have been raised with the Messiah, seek what is above. Where the Messiah is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on what is above and not what is on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with the Messiah in God. When the Messiah, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, put to death what belongs to the worldly nature. Now, he's going to tell us again, here's what you should put off. He's going to tell us what to put off, and he's going to tell us what to put on. And remember, in Peter, he tells us how to adorn ourselves. And we, when we do that, we're doing what? We're letting our light shine. So watch this. He says, um, therefore put to death, verse 5 again, what belongs to the worldly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, because of these, God's wrath comes on the disobedient. And you once walked in these when you were living in them. But now, notice this, you put away all the following, anger, wrath, malice, slander, Filthy communications out of your mouth. Uh, verse 9. Do not lie one to another since <coughs> you have put off the old self with these practices. And have what? Put on the new self. Now I want to skip down to verse 12. Therefore God's chosen, holy, beloved. Put on. Now remember. And Peter he tells us to what? To adorn ourselves to what? Let our lives shine. So that if we're putting these things on, he just told us what to put off, right? He just told us what to put off. Um, and so let's say if I'm not putting off those works of the flesh, anger, wrath, malice, right, sexual sins, what do people see? Now watch this. And if this is how I'm living my life, right? If I'm living my life, and I'm not talking about salvation. I'm not talking about God's mercy. But watch this. If I'm living my, if 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 this is the way that I'm living my life, sexual immo in sexual worldly nature, the sexual immorality. This is verse five. I meant impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, idolatry. Now watch this. If that's what I'm living in, anger, wrath, malice, right, uh, slander, filthy communication out of your mouth. Right, do not lie to one one another. If that's how I'm living my life then I'm not being a light, am I? So now I go back to what he says, if the salt has lost its taste, what good is it? In other words, if that's how I'm going to live my life, 
then as far as God is concerned, you have no reason to be here. Right? So you're, 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 it's, it's not worth for you to be here. So he tells me then what? To put off. And then he tells me to put on. Right? Um, oh, where am I at? Go back to verse 9 again. No, verse 12. He says, Therefore, God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, heartfelt, uh, put on, right? Put on heartfelt compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, accepting one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must forgive. Now watch this, verse 14, above all, <clears throat> put on, right? Notice he tells me, put on, put these things on, put them on. Above all, put on love, the perfect bond of unity, and let the peace of the Messiah, to which you were also called in one body, control your hearts and be thankful. Now, notice those qualities that he tells me. He tells me <laughs> what to put off. And then he says what? He tells us what to adorn, what to put on ourselves, these qualities here. So if I'm putting on the godly qualities, that's the light that will cause people to what? See our good works. And if they see our good works, in turn, they will glorify God. Okay. And so um, that's why when I go back to these be attitudes, that's why I said, notice these are qualities. They're not attitudes. <laughs> Um, they're not attitudes. I'm going to read them again. Verse 3. The poor in spirit are blessed, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Those who mourn are blessed, for they will be comforted. The gentle are blessed, for they will inherit the earth. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are blessed, for they will be filled. The merciful are blessed, for they will be shown mercy. The pure in heart are blessed, for they will see God. <coughs> Excuse me. The peacemakers are blessed. But they would be called sons of God, and those who are persecuted for righteousness are blessed. For the kingdom of heaven is yours, and you are blessed when they insult and persecute you falsely and say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice, because your reward is great in heaven. For that is how they persecuted the prophets before you. You are the salt of the earth. Now, so notice the, yeah, so notice the sequence. This is what we kind of been studying with all of the different other writers. Now, by the way, remember, uh, Jesus is the foundation. And when we read all of the other scriptures that we read from Paul and Peter, remember, they built upon the foundation that Jesus laid. Okay. So he says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how could it be made salty? It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled by men. So a wasted life, if you're just living your life, you, you again, you don't have, and I should put it this way, you don't have God's purpose. You're not living God's purpose. And notice is that what he says. So you're, you know, you're not, it's not, God is not backing that, if you're just going to live in your flesh, and again, we're not talking salvation here, nor are we talking about the mercy of God. That's that's forever in Jesus. Jesus is the propitiation of our sins. What Jesus is talking about here is now, and remember the context here is, you're here in the earth because you are my disciples. And if you're going to follow me, here is my prescription. So, first, adorn yourself. Possess these qualities. Then, he says, you're the salt of the earth. So, you're here to be salt. And in verse 14, you're the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on the lampstand. And it gives light for all who are in the world. Look at my picture again. See, look at that the earth with all those points of light. And again, just kind of pretend 
those are Christians all over the world, giving light all over the world. Then he says, in the same way, let your light shine before men so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So now, as <clears throat> this is the kind of the foundation that he is pouring because as we move further now, we're going to get into where he's going to make a scathing rebuke kind of of what man's religion is and particularly the the, the um the pharisees but the application that we can certainly use today has been just as devastating denominations have been just ruin a people in their faith in their walk there are people who think that um that um as long as they go to church on sunday right as long as they go to church on sunday uh and that's it but remember you're placed as lights all over and i want to even say this because i hear people oftentimes they spend a lot of endeavor and effort to try to get people to come to their church you're the light right you're the light they need not to go further and as i kind of mentioned probably before in one of my testimonies the people that the two men who led me to the lord led me to the lord um at a supermarket not at a church now after that they took me to church but i want to say it was a maybe a couple of weeks a few weeks of me watching them of them witnessing to me before i came to faith by watching them watching their life so the, the, this idea that we're going to um, we got to get them to church um, that's yeah that's one option but that's not God never told you to get anybody to church you are the light you, you, you're the church you're the light that when people watch you when they watch your life that you ought to be able, by your lifestyle, cause people to come to faith, cause people to glorify God in you. All right, guys, um, we're going to move on in chapter, like I say, chapters five, and then chapters five, six, and seven is, you know, the Sermon on the Mount. And then again, we're going to kind of go back and forth. Uh, you're going to see Jesus is going to go back and forth with. This is what man's religion is. This is what hypocrites are. But here are what a true follower of Christ, a sincere follower of Christ would be. All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you in the next study. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. See you next time. All right.